Morning, everyone. It is my huge pleasure and a real privilege to introduce Fred Swanaker next, who is a true visionary in the field of African leadership. Fred has had an incredible career. He launched the African Leadership Academy in 2004, and by 2017, almost a thousand future leaders had joined the academy. Many people would think that was enough of an achievement, but in 2013, Fred took another visionary step launching a network of 25 African universities to launch 3 million ethical, innovative leaders by 2035. Two of those are open now. The African Leadership University has campuses in Rwanda and Mauritius, delivering an exciting, inspirational approach to learning. Fred is a real inspiration to all of us. He thinks big, innovates far, and builds networks to effectively deliver his visions. We are so lucky to have him here today and to learn from his wisdom. So thank you very much, Fred. So Fred, have you ever seen a lion or a zebra in the wilderness? This is the first question that I got asked when I uh, arrived at McAllister College in Minnesota in, um, when was it? Sometime in the 90s. Um, and uh, my answer to that question was that yes, I have seen a lion as ever, but only in the zoo, just like you. And this is because, um, you know, even though I'd grown up in Botswana and Zimbabwe. I spent about, uh, some, I'm originally from Ghana. Uh, I left Ghana at the age of four. And then every four years of my life, I moved to a different country on the continent. So I lived in Gambia for a little bit, and then Botswana for a few years, and then Zimbabwe for a few years. Um, and then I went to college in the US. And um, they asked me this question. I said, have you ever seen a lion or zebra? I said, yes, only in a zoo. And the reason was that, for that is because um, even though I lived in these countries that had tremendous stocks of wildlife, my family couldn't afford the hundreds of dollars that it cost to go and stay in the fancy game lodges in Botswana, for example. And so after I graduated from college, I moved to South Africa, and uh, I got a job working with McKinsey and Company, management consulting. And uh, at the time, they were doing um, uh, a pro bono project for an organization called Conservation Corporation that owned a bunch of lodges in South Africa. And one of the perks of that was that McKinsey Consultants could go and stay at these lodges for free. So I asked a friend, I said, oh, which is the best one to go? He said, oh, this place called Londolosi. I said, okay, that sounds good. I registered and went to Londolosi. And I was just blown away. The first time, I was now 22, and I saw a lion in the wilderness. I saw a zebra, I saw an elephant, I saw a lion, a leopard. And, you know, the incredible landscapes. And just being out there in nature and being so close to this tremendous asset that we have as a continent that I've never seen. Um, and I remember thinking, wow, why, is, I'm, why am I the youngest person here? And why, why do all the women have so much jewelry? And, you know, I had no idea how much it cost. Only as I was leaving, I asked them, I said, how much does it cost to stay here? And they told me, you know, today to go to the village, it's something like uh, $3,000 a night or something. Um, and that, this was my first experience. Now, unfortunately, every other safari after that has been as a plane. But um, unfortunately, too many Africans grew up in this way. We grew up experiencing wildlife as something that doesn't belong to us. Are some that's locked away for the benefit of others to come and enjoy. And so, fast forward um, several years later, after I worked for a couple of years with Kinsey, I went to business school, and then I came back to Africa and decided that I was going to set up an institution to develop the next generation of leaders for the continent. Because one of the things that I've also come to realize is that Africa has many, many challenges. But number one of those challenges is leadership. And unless we address that issue, we won't be able to really address all of our other issues. So we started something called the African Leadership Academy, which um, 
the, the vision was to develop the next generation of ESL sort of content, and that has expanded later on to the African Leadership University, as was mentioned. And today we're on a quest to develop three million leaders for the content of Africa. Um, really identifying the most outstanding young people on the continent that we believe have the courage, the imagination, the passion, and the resilience to transform the continent. And connecting them to each other so that they can work together to form a force that can really transform Africa. And to solve what we call this, the, the, the big challenges and the great opportunities facing the continent. Because as we set out to build these leaders, we said, you know, we don't just want to develop leaders for leaders' sake. We believe really, that we want leaders to have a purpose. They need to have a, special, a specific mission that they're on. And so, you know, traditional universities have a school of law, a school of business, school of engineering, and students do, um, you know, Bachelor of Arts in History and Chemistry and so forth. What we've done is we've said, um, Instead of getting our students to declare an academic major in a specific discipline, we ask them to choose a mission which is related to solving what we call the seven grand challenges and the seven great opportunities of life. So we've identified the big problems that we need to solve. Because leaders should be problem solvers. They need to do things, especially the hard things that need to be done to solve society's big problems. And so we identified a list of what we call the seven grand challenges. These are big issues like healthcare, climate change, and governance, and infrastructure, big, big problems that we need to solve in Africa. And, if we, and we're really starting from a difficult place if we're trying to solve those. But we have another list of what we call the seven great opportunities. And these are the areas where Africa's been blessed, where we have an unusual competitive advantage, but we haven't captured them yet. And we have no excuse for not being world class in those seven areas. Number one in that list is agriculture. We spend about $40 billion a year importing food into Africa. That we have perfect soil conditions to grow. We have lots of rain, we have sunshine. The largest amount of arable land that has not yet been cultivated. And number two on that list, uh, tourism, another huge opportunity. Conservation. We have some of the most unique biodiversity in the world that no one else has. We've been blessed with this as well. The empowerment of women, I think is another massive untapped opportunity for the continent, unless we can get 50% of our population fully contributing to the continent's future. There's no way we're going to get to where we need to get to. The arts, the creative industry, is another untapped opportunity. Um, regional integration, how to get our economies to work together and so forth. Right? So we have this list of opportunities. Um, natural resource management is another one. And so what we have done is we said, actually, let's not build a school of law, a school of business, a school of engineering. We're going to build our schools around these seven challenges and seven opportunities. And that's what led us to start. The first school is actually the ALU School of Wildlife Conservation. And today I want to share with you a bit about the philosophy that we, are, um, fo that we follow in this, in this conservation school as we look to develop the next generation of conservation leaders for Africa. The main thing that we're trying to do is to really reframe conservation from a sector that is about protecting a shrinking asset. Because if you think about it, the whole word conservation is about protection. It's about, it's about conserving something that is dying. It's about protecting a shrinking asset. Right? And so what we are daring to do, what we challenge these young leaders to do, and then I want to challenge all of you in this room today, is to imagine a different future, an alternative. Something that I'd like to call maybe more akin to environmental investing. Right? Thinking about this, say, the question I want to ask is how do we think, how could we reimagine a world where we're not in defense mode, trying to protect the shrinking asset, but we're actually in expansion mode. We're trying to make nature more abundant and trying to think about a world of, of where, where, where more and more um, of, our, of our continent is being, of our resources are being invested in nature because we see it actually not as a shrinking asset, but as an asset that is growing. Something that becomes one of the key pillars of Africa's future. 
Because as I mentioned, it's one of the great opportunities where we've been blessed and we have an unusual asset that no one else has. Because today, you know, conservation is typically seen as a sector that has died. It's a dying sector. If you think about different industries around the world, no one tells you that this is one of the biggest boom industries, right? You've never heard of that, so you typically don't hear that. Let see the top 10 industries in the world. You typically will not see conservation on that list. That's so what we're saying. Is what, what, what if you could change things such that that became one of the biggest industries? Because in my mind, um, to do that, we need to think about the characteristics that typically make growth industries. So, the way we look at it is that there are three characteristics of growth industries. The first characteristic is that they have an enabling environment. So when you look at the industries that we all talk about that are growing like technology and banking and so forth, that we all see massive investments in. There's normally been an enabling environment that has been created, typically by leaders in that, in that sector. So leadership is the number one most important thing that we have to get right if we're going to get conservation to become a growth industry. Which is why it's exciting to me to see that so much of your, conservation, so much of your conversations here over the last couple of days have been about leadership. And there's leadership training, and there's, you know, we have some of the, the uh, political leaders in this country coming to this event. So we just had heard from one of Altia, your inspiring story. And later on, we have uh, the first lady coming, and you know, understand that Honorable Najib Balala is also going to be here. So, when you look at the countries in Africa, where you actually see wildlife increasing and nature becoming more abundant, you realize that it's something that's been made a priority by, the, by the, the highest level leaders in those countries. So countries like Rwanda, Namibia, Botswana, even Kenya. Unless we get the leaders to make the right policies and to really see this as a priority, we're not going to be able to really uh, make this a growth sector. So that's the first thing. And that's why we said we're going to focus on leaders and developing the next generation of leaders who can um, uh, really uh, make this enabling environment possible. The second thing that a growth industry has is that it attracts the best talent into that industry. Right, so if you ask a young person today, where do you want to work? They say, I want to work in technology. I want to work in Google. I want to work in Facebook. Right? So young talent, if young talent is not going into your industry, then you are not a growth industry. You're a dying industry. So last year I went to speak at a conservation conference uh, in South Africa. And when I walked in, the average age of everyone there was about 50. <laughs> and today, conservation, sadly, is the domain of a 60-year-old white man with a beard. Right? And so as long as that continues, this is a sector that is a dying sector. So what we need, what we believe, is that we need a new generation of young people to go into conservation, women to go into conservation, you know, um, people, so much diversity to go into the sector. Because unless young people, unless women are going into conservation, um, this is not gonna go. Unless you see black Africans going into conservation, this isn't going, this isn't going to, to change. So we, this is something that, um, is vital to the future of the sector. And so what we're trying to do is to get this seen to be a sexy industry. Yeah. Something as sexy as going to work at Google, Facebook. If we can, unless we get Africa's best brains, our best talent going into the sector, that is so strategic to the continent, there's no way we're gonna be able to actually catch our full potential as one of the great opportunities for the continent. So I wanna show you a short video that gives you a sense of one of these young people that we're grooming to go into the sector. And this, I believe, is the, the kind of um, image of, se of, of the sector that needs to change, where, where people like this are seen as conservationists and not the 60 year old white man with the beard. Can we play this video? No sound.
tell you that this woman's name is Gloria. <laughs> and she comes from Rwanda. So this is the second characteristic, the, the, the talent. The third and final characteristic of a growth industry is that it must make money. Because sectors that are not financially sustainable sadly do not grow. And so one of the things that has historically been missing from the conservation, uh, conservation, uh, conservation, colonization, <laughs> from the conversation of the conservation, is that we don't think about it in terms of how it creates economic potential for, 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 for Africa. And, and, and the reason why this is so important is that we live in a continent where poverty is the number one thing on most people's minds. This is the fastest growing population in the world. We are the poorest continent in the world. Uh, average age, the average age of a young of an African is 19, whereas the average age of a German or Japanese is 47. So the number one thing that is on most Africans' minds is how do I get a job? How do I get food on the table? How do I put a roof over my head? And unless we as conservationists are able to think in that way as well, to think about how we actually um, develop sustainable models for conservation, that actually create wealth, that give jobs to people, that give income to communities. We're going to have a fundamental misalignment between the interests of people and the interests of nature. And you know, I would say that conservation, animals don't need uh, us to take care of them. They need to take care of themselves. Nature is able to take care of itself. The whole field is only because the humans came into the picture, right? For centuries, for, 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 for you know, billions of years, wildlife took care of itself, nature took care of itself. Only when humans enter the picture do we, do we see this becoming a problem, right? And so we have to think about conservation not only from the perspective of nature, but we need to think about it from the perspective of people as well. Unless we take into, into account the interests of communities that live around protected areas and the interests of countries, that have wildlife assets, and how we actually we can align that to their interests, which is really how do they put something in their pocket. We're not going to be able to actually see the sector grow. And so one of the things that we're doing in the school is really getting to develop a generation of conservationists that are not only thinking about conservation biology and ecology, but are thinking about politics and economics and power. Because that really today is what conservation is about. And so, as you think about your roles, I really hope that you will also think about how you can put nature in the language that political leaders will understand, which is how does it grow the economies? How does it create jobs? How many taxes are paid because of nature and conservation? So one of the things that we're doing at the School of, of Conservation is we're launching a research into the wildlife economy in Africa and how to really actually bring something quantitative to this, to show how much of Africa's GDP comes from nature, how many jobs are created, how much tax, and how much is coming from different sectors, different types. So is it coming, what is coming from ecotourism versus carbon versus other forms, um, you know, photography, film, there's so many interesting industries that can be built around this thing. And one of the things that, um, and so we have an MBA in conservation, a Master's of Business Administration in Conservation, where we're trying to get conservation leaders to learn the language of business and so forth, so they can actually go and talk to the political leaders and say, you know, I'm here to talk to you about something that's going to give you votes, something that's going to create jobs for your country. That's something that a politician will listen. 
That's because I'm dead and that's really what they care about. I might not raise. <laughs> so we have to learn to talk the language of business if we're going to actually become effective in conservation. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do to Fender as well, because in Africa especially, that's how we're going to really catalyze this as a whole set. And we're going to actually start to see more land being allocated to, to um, you know, to, 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 protect, to be protected. We're going to start to see better policies being created that are going to actually ensure the environment uh, becomes more abundant and doesn't shrink. And so, you know, one of the other videos I was going to show is there's a video that somebody can watch on CNN, which shows some of our students in Mauritius who have built this, that's what this video. They, 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 they realize that, um, one of the MBA students actually realized that um, there was a massive challenge with uh, bee extinction, which as I'm sure many of you know. And of course, if bees go extinct, the entire food supply chain that we as human beings live on is a threat, right? And so, this, they, this shows how they come up with um, a new technology to build um, beehives that are called smart beehives, where they're using sensors in the beehives to track the temperature, the humidity, the sound levels, the noise, and so forth, to be able to see what's going on in these beehives, to be able to actually track how healthy they are, to, so for bee farmers to be able to actually optimize um, the health of these bee beehives and so forth. The next phase of the project, they're going to be putting sensors on the bees' wings so that as they fly, you can track where they're going and see actually what, you know, um, at what point are they dropping off, where they're dying and so forth, and to be able to actually leverage data and analytics to be able to, to study this. Um, and this is the kind of innovation and leveraging technology and actually building something that's financially sustainable because they're doing this as well as a business that we need to be thinking about as conservation. Because very often, um, we confuse the social impact that we're trying to bring to the world with our business model. And it's very important that we, we distinguish the two. Because if you think about Google, what is Google's business model? Advertising. Advertising. That's their business model, right? But what is Google's social mission? Provide information, right? So Google set out, the founders of Google set out to democratize access to information because they thought they, they, that information was a scarce resource, it was hidden, it was hoarded by a few people. And they said, we're going to democratize and make it accessible to everyone in the world. And so today, thanks to Google, they literally have changed the world, right? I couldn't have gone here this morning without Google Maps. <laughs> we all have access to so much more. I mean, I remember, I don't know, some of the, I see many young faces in the room, but there was a time when I was in college where if you wanted to do research, you had to go to the library and look through something called microfiche. <laughs> right? This tiny thing that, where they had compressed text, and you had to then take it and put it on the projector, and, and it was crazy, very archaic. Today, a child in a rural village in Africa has access to more information on this thing than someone who was doing a PhD 30 years ago because of Google. They really, really changed the world, right? YouTube and you know Google Maps and Gmail, all these things that they have done to change the world, to bring information, to democratize us, to empower people. That's their social mission. Their business model is advertising, right? So similarly, as we think about what we are doing in conservation, we need to think about, yes, we've obviously, we want, we have a, you know, a passion for nature. We want to see our wildlife protected. We want to see the better policies being created. We want to, you know, um, to see this thing that we love to thrive and to grow. But we shouldn't confuse that with our business model. And we need to think very, very deliberately about our business model and how we actually make that um, sustainable so that we can actually do what we love. Right? So for example, do you know that in Kenya, Seven billion dollars of like the Chinese GDP comes from, you know, wildlife. Ten percent of the economy here is related to tourism. One point one million jobs. 
this is the language that we need to be talking. So when we go to politicians, we can actually say, you know, this is one of the most important sectors of the economy. And so, and the whole, every young Kenyan needs to know this. Because this then becomes one of the key pillars of Kenya's success. And if we pull this right, we can be the first continent to develop because of nature. Because everywhere else, you know, there's many, many disadvantages about being an African, right? There's a lot of poverty in Africa, lack of infrastructure, we're the last continent to develop. But there's one thing that we have which others don't have, which is we, we are starting from a clean slate in a way. We can learn from the mistakes that other parts of the world have done as they have been developed. And one thing we have is we haven't destroyed all our nature yet. And so how do we think about actually this being one of our greatest assets, where we actually grow our economies, create jobs, become prosperous because of nature, and where nature doesn't become a consequence or a casualty of development. And I believe that by doing these three things, thinking about this as a growth sector, and I really think we need to really rebrand conservation and call it environmental investing or something like that, so that young people excited about it and say, when you go to a cocktail party and say, what do you do? I'm an environmental investor. Like, oh wow, that's a sexy industry. How do I get into that sector? <laughs> right? That's the conservation conversation we should be having. And unless we do that, where we really create the enabling environment through leadership, and we get young, diverse, talented women going into conservation, and unless we actually think about how this becomes, um, has a viable business model, we won't be able to achieve this full potential. So that's really what I wanted to share with you today, Alex. And, and, and uh, as you con continue your deliberations, um, to really hopefully share some, um, you know, that, 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 that could, this, this could provoke uh, some interesting uh, dialogue. So, um, thank you. in the South African Wildlife College. Um, yeah, I mean, we have been, um, uh, we hope that we can, we can collaborate with them to, um, you know, obviously, I don't think that um, what they are doing needs to be entirely thrown out the window, right? Because I think that, obviously, we still do need to know about conservation biology and ecology, and you know, we need to actually understand, uh, you know, the science of, na of nature as well. Um, so I, I see it as more of, you know, uh, we need to do both. So, you know, we'd love to see how we can, and we have been, you know, reaching out and, you know, we, we, we sent a delegation to the South African Wildlife College last year to see how we can do, how we can collaborate. And we're absolutely looking to see how we can um, bring our philosophy together with theirs and to influence, um, uh, you know, how they're, they're training the next generation of conservation leaders um, in these institutions. Um, and also, you know, we actually want to see how this becomes a mainstream philosophy in all education in Africa. So, you know, even though we have a school of conservation where some of our young leaders specialize and they pick that as their sector, 100% of all the three million leaders that we're developing in the future, we want them to go through at least a basics course in conservation. So, you know, it could be a four week course, it could be a six week or two months, because what we believe is that, you know, conservation needs to come out of the shadows. Today it's done, it's, it's something that is, it's either the domain of an activist or a billionaire, or a scientist. And we're saying that it needs to be something that everyone understands. So that, you know, one day, um, you know, if, if you are become the president of a country and, and the, your minister of the environment is asking for a budget for nature, you understand why. If you're the CEO of a company and you're about to, you know, chop down 
a forest to build a mine, you can think differently about, oh wow, there could be some chimpanzees in that forest, let me think differently about it. So we're trying to really get this to mainstream, not just in you know, those wildlife colleges, but can we actually get all universities in Africa and all you know, uh, institutions that are um, developing you know, the, the future minds of, of this continent to, to really integrate this into their you know, all fields of study and so that it's not just this thing that's in, in, in a silo. Because we need to move outside of, so for example, one thing we do every year, we have a business of conservation conference. And as we were designing that, we said that only 20% uh, of the attendees will be conservationists. We want to bring people from business, from politics, from entertainment, from <laughs> media, into the conversation so that we're breaking the silos. Uh, so that's, that's part of the thing. Right, I think we have time for one more question. So, pick who you think looks most passionate. Peter Lizzie, no. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, when you're trying to drive innovation, especially in the sector that is as conservative as higher education, you need to pick your battles and figure out how to start. So one of my philosophies is that when you're starting something new in Africa, you need to go not necessarily where the market is largest. So for example, Nigeria or Ethiopia, you know, there's a huge populations. But you need to go where your headaches are fewest. <laughs> so when we were starting, we opened the first university in Mauritius and the second one in Rwanda. Those countries tend to have more visionary leaders. Um, you don't have to, because you know, you're trying to figure out your model and trying to get you know, the innovation developed. You also don't want to be worrying about issues like corruption and that you don't have electricity and water and all these things that is not your core business. So we said, let's go to these countries and perfect our model and develop it first. That's, what those, that's why we started those two countries. And then once you have that, then you can do two things. One is you can bring the leaders from the other countries that are a bit more challenging to come and see what you're doing. And you say, okay, if you want this in your country, then you need to change these things. And then we'll bring this to your country. So that's been our philosophy. And then finally, um, now that we've built our muscle in the last six years of, in these sort of more friendly environments, we're now venturing into other countries. So now I've moved to Kenya, and we've opened up a site here in Kenya, and we're going to other countries. Uh, you know, th th this year we're probably gonna open it in about nine other countries. Um, so, Senegal, Abidjan, Accra, Lagos, Cairo, Niger, these are all in our, in our pipeline. And uh, now we are starting to scale up across the world in our model. Thank you very much, enjoy the rest of the day.